Okay, so we we were in a discussion no no about questions no Christian can answer. We started having a long, fairly interesting, productive co conversation about the crucifixion itself. So to further our knowledge, or to, to let's take a look at the crucifixion. And there's a couple things I want to point out. Point number one. Jesus was an innocent man. Even according to Pontius Pilate. That's very important. Pontius Pilate says, specifically, I find no sin in this man. In other words, he is not guilty. He is an innocent man. Why is that important? Because the, the world at the time crucified an innocent man that they declared innocent according to their courts, according to their system. They declared him innocent and then put him to death of their own will, of their own volition. Now, Rome, at the time, the Roman Empire was, you know, basically the known world. It was the civilized world at the time. So what is God trying to show us? Metaphorically speaking, yes, it happened in real time, a real event in history, but he's trying to show us metaphorically, this is the kind of world, we live in the kind of world that puts an innocent man to death. That is the type of world that we inhabit. The Bible calls it a present evil world. The Bible goes on to say, love not the world or those who are in the world because everything that is in the world is not of the Father, but of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. So we live in the one, point number one, we live in the kind of world, even today, United States of America, we live in the kind of world that puts an innocent man to death. That is, happens in the United States of America probably ten times a day. Or maybe not, maybe not that much. Now, point number two. The Pharisees were trying to kill Jesus, were the ones who put Jesus, were, were one, trying to get him killed. The Pharisees were the religious order of the day, and the Bible is very specific about this. They dotted every T and dotted every I. They were 100% circumspect in the practice of the form of religion that they carried. But their hearts were black. Their hearts were cruel. Jesus said, you wash the outside of the vessel. You wash the outside of the vessel, but inside you are filthy. That's very important, too. It was when we talked, I had a discussion with, with Holy Kool-Aid about religion. Christianity isn't about religion. The religious order of the time were the ones who wanted Jesus crucified. Religion is about rules and regulations and, and clinging to orthodoxy and dogmatic teachings. It isn't about Jesus Christ. It was the religious order of the day. Tracy Harris herself brought this up on the last time I listened to athe the atheist experience. It was the Pharisees. They were the religious order of the day. They sometimes seem more like some of our church people today. I'm not naming any names. So, that's point number two. Why is the sacrifice required? I speculated, theologically, first of all, another interesting thing to note about the crucifixion, whether you can intellectually understand it or not is irrelevant. Atheists love to say, so Jesus died on the cross, but you know, so God sent himself in the form of self and tried to make it sound ridiculous. It's not supposed to sound intelligent to you. It doesn't really matter. I've chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So, it sounds ridiculous to you. Too great. Irrelevant to God. Irrelevant. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to you. Great. You prove nothing. I have, again, I have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It is supposed to satisfy something in God alone, whether we understand it or not, immaterial. The Bible says, cling not to your own, trust the Lord with all your heart, cling not to your own understanding. It's irrelevant whether we understand it intellectually or not. It's fun to talk about, it's interesting, but it's also irrelevant. God had the crucifixion in real time. I was speculating on why he would do it that way. Why? Because there is no such thing in the world as moral action without moral consequence. When you act, when you do things in the real world, there are real consequences in real time. You hit your kid, for example, a sin. 
not just theologically, an evil act in real time that has consequences. If you've ever been smacked around as a kid, you know for a fact that when people hit you when you were younger, it had real consequences in real time, and it bore fruit in the real world. Actions do not eliminate themselves. They need to be paid for by a just God. That is what the cross is trying to do. It is trying to establish perfect justice, but more importantly, perfect mercy. Somebody said, you know, it's not just. Good. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God it's not just. No, it's not completely just. Why? Because a whole lot of people go free. That's the point. That's the point. No, it's not perfect. It's perfect justice matched with perfect mercy. And God leans on the side of mercy. So, why would, he, why would he need it to occur? Is that the only way that God could have paid for people's sins? I don't know. But if you understand, if you can, you can look at it correctly, you can see perfection in it. You can see moral perfection in it. You can see perfect justice in it. You can see perfect mercy in it. Why would God do something different than absolute perfection? Jesus lived a perfect life, not committed not one sin, then died on a cross. Why would God create a system? And, and by the way, we are all have freedom to accept or reject, to live our life, and even have freedom to live our life you know, pretty slipshod, pretty, pretty, pretty much according to whatever that whatever we want to do. There's a lot involved in the theology of the cross. It's a lot deeper than meets the eyes. A lot, a lot more to it than just what we talked about. So that's all for now. I'll go more into it later. Okay, bye.